many of you may remember the eschatological prophecies arising in 2012 about a hypothetical planet called Nibiru, also often confused with Planet X, which was supposed to wipe out all life on Earth. The rumor was predicated on the belief that the Mayan calendar, which dates back to at least the 5th century BCE, was scheduled to cease its existence on the 21st of December 2012. While the world is still spinning as evident by the rotation of this globe, we did narrowly escape a catastrophic event. An event that hadn't occurred in December, but way back in July. The event was potentially so powerful that it could have pressed the reset button on human civilization, throwing it decades back into the past. The event in question is something known as a coronal mass ejection, or CME for short. It is an occurrence where the sun spews forth large amounts of magnetized plasma into the outer space. See, the sun rotates once every 27 days, but different areas of the sun rotate at differing speeds. This causes the sun's magnetic field to twist and distort. The sun also goes through activity cycles, as the electrically charged electrons and protons in the sun's plasma flow, they produce a magnetic field. Every 11 years, the sun's magnetic field reorganizes itself, resulting in these highs and lows, also called solar maximum and minimum. Solar maximum disturbances, also known as sunspots on the sun's surface, increase significantly during these times of peak activity. If a flare is powerful enough, it will often discharge massive amounts of plasma or charged particles from the sun's surface or corona. These are called coronal mass ejection events. According to the Solar Dynamics Observatory, the Earth was in the same position just nine days prior when the sun erupted with a solar flare in 2012. This could easily have been one of the biggest catastrophic disasters in human history. If the flare had occurred just nine days earlier, and pointed squarely at Earth. The vast majority of humanity remained blissfully oblivious of the cosmic near-miss taking place above us. But that doesn't mean there isn't a cause for alarm. Of course, the Sun always continuously releases a solar wind of these particles. Usually, the magnetic field of the Earth perfectly protects us from the radiation caused by these particles. But during solar flares, the Sun emits far more material than usual a massive blob of magnetized plasma. The power of a solar storm is equal to the energy that our entire civilization could consume within a million years. And while some storms take two days to hit the planet, big ejections take only 12 hours. Scientists believe that solar flares are easily one of the most apocalyptic events that can happen, since the Earth is basically rotating around a massive ticking nuclear fusion bomb. Although we got lucky in 2012, we weren't spared the mayhem in 1859. London, Thursday, 1st of September, 1859. The city is devastated by cholera. Tens of millions of people are infected. 10,000 are dead. On the other hand, technology is experiencing a boom. A very straightforward yet complicated system is brought to the public, the telegraph. Using this device, people could communicate with anyone hundreds of miles away with a similar device. But Richard Carrington, a 30-year-old amateur astronomer, is intrigued by something shrouded in mystery. Throughout his six-year investigation of sunspots, he thought people were only now beginning to realize how important they are. Carrington had spent a lot of time keeping track of their movements. But on the morning of Thursday, September 1st, 1859, while he is focused on the sun, all of a sudden it appeared as if a white light had flashed into his eyes. Although he didn't realize it then, but Carrington had just witnessed two bright solar flares. As he returned to his work as usual, a few minutes later, the telegraph system was set on fire the only communication system at that time. While in other locations, something really bizarre is taking place. The telegraphs are operating without power, as if an electric charge in the atmosphere were transferring the electric current. Reports exist that when people woke up, 
they were treated with auroras in the sky almost everywhere on the planet. And during the night, the auroras were so bright that you could read a book to them. People gathered everywhere and stared up, horrified and awestruck in equal measure. The heavens shone red in certain spots, as though reflecting a bright conflagration. It was only 1 a.m. in Virginia when a railroad conductor became enraged by the sound of Lark singing as if it were morning. He pulled out his revolver and shot three birds to death so that he could go back to sleep. Most people were unaware of what they were seeing and could only surmise that it was a sign of the end of the world. According to recent post-apocalyptic studies, it was the most powerful solar flare in the last 500 years or so. Since then, there have been about 2,000 solar flares every 11 years in the sun's solar cycle, with solar lows and highs. Not all were as powerful as the Carrington event, though. A solar flare's power determines how much harm it will do. Hence, scientists have divided solar storms primarily into five types, where each one of those categories is 10 times more intense than the others. A-class flares are among the weakest types of solar flares. Typically, they are insignificant and have little to no impact on Earth. Stronger than A-class flares, B-class flares have the potential to slightly interfere with radio communications and navigational systems. Solar flares of the C-class classification are the most frequent, but generally only considered to be mild annoyances. M-class flares, which are more potent than C-class flares, have the potential to interfere with many satellite communications and power systems. The most destructive type of solar flares, known as X-class flares, have the ability to completely destroy electrical and communication infrastructure. X-class solar flares are observed to happen roughly 10 times a year and can produce energy equal to a billion hydrogen bombs. Very, very scary. The last solar peak was in 2014. The next solar maximum will occur in 2025. Much, much more of the world's infrastructure now has come to be dependent on electricity than just telegraph systems. Today's planet would experience some of the most extensive blackouts ever if a strong solar storm were to strike it. Power, communications and satellites, and the majority of modern technology all failing at once. There would be no traffic control in cities. Hospitals would be left in the dark. Card-based transactions would be impossible. Bank accounts may be completely wiped out, and supply networks would fall apart. But the most terrifying part will take place in the skies, not on the ground, with up to 20,000 planes in the air at any given time, all of which rely on GPS. It is an unprecedented disaster when their maps go blank. Some flight might be able to land without difficulty, but sadly, many others wouldn't. The world at large could be thrown back hundreds of years in terms of technology, and this wouldn't even necessarily be just for the duration of the event. Power grids could sustain irreparable damage if they weren't shut down to protect them before the incident. Given the size of some power systems, experts predict that a worst-case scenario might require up to 10 years to fully recover from. Depending on the size of the storm and where it hits the world, it might cause all of this devastation to a single continent, or possibly the entire planet. If a solar storm of Carrington-level magnitude did strike the entire world, the cleanup of the technological doom might cost upwards of $2 trillion US dollars. Even more extreme studies estimate that the cost could be as high as $20 trillion. The most expensive disaster in history was the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that struck Japan, known as the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. That had only caused $411 billion in damage nearly five times less than what this solar storm may cost us in the future. Therefore, are we prepared for a widespread worldwide power outage? A X-class solar storm, so to speak. And what can we do to combat this? In 1989, we had to learn it the hard way when we received a sneak peek into the future. Although it wasn't anywhere near the power of the Carrington event, a massive X-class solar storm struck Quebec in 1989. People in Cuba and Florida could see auroras in the sky. North America's entire interconnected electrical grid groaned under the strain. The electrical grid in the Canadian province of Quebec 
couldn't manage the demand, and went completely offline. And as the saying goes, misfortune seldom comes alone. For 12 hours in the freezing Quebec winter, almost the entire province was without power. The timing could not have been worse. Today, the 1989 Quebec blackout serves as a reminder of the destructive power of solar storms and their strength. It must be emphasized that the question isn't if, but rather when. Many people believe that a huge Carrington-level catastrophe occurs on Earth once every 150 years on average. More than 160 years have passed since the Carrington event as of the time of recording. We are by some measures overdue. Scientists predict there is a 12% chance that it may happen in the next five years. The problem is that no one takes the global space threat warning seriously. And it is not strange that experts have frequently mispredicted the end of the world, beginning with the El Nino comet in 2011 and continuing with several asteroid collisions. Caitlin Durkovich, a special assistant to the President of the United States, is frustrated that some people assume space weather is a made-up Hollywood fiction. In contrast to 1859, it's likely we would receive a heads-up by NASA and the Space Weather Protection Center if a geomagnetic storm were to hit Earth in 2025. A massive solar storm would allow us at least 12 hours to prepare, and the level of that preparation would have a significant impact on the event's long-term ramifications. Any systems that could be harmed by the event would need to be taken offline in a quick and coordinated response for the length of the event. So in the best case scenario, a Carrington level event would only cause significant global disruption for one week. On the other hand, there is the worst case scenario, which would last for decades in which we are unprepared or do not have enough time to take action before a Carrington level disaster occurs. Our growing reliance on satellite technologies is contributing to the stress around space weather. It is evident that there is nothing we can do to prevent solar storms or coronal mass ejections. However, it also seems nearly inconceivable that we would slow down the pace of technological advancement. Millionaires and politicians will almost certainly find a place to hide, and you won't have much luck collecting a golden ticket in a chocolate bar to access a secret government bunker. So what if something happens? Should we ordinary people do? I found a location that could act as a haven. It is a submerged bridge that connects Sweden and Denmark across the Orsund. It has plenty of space and is perfect for turning into a safe shelter. Here are its coordinates. You might not need them, but if the end of the world scenario occurs, humanity would want assistance in restoring technology, science, and society. If you're willing to take on such a serious mission, start packing your backpack. What do you think? Is there anything we missed? Let us know in the comments. Consider subscribing to the channel if you liked the video, and as always, thanks for watching.